Well, it's great to have everybody here this morning. So our book uh, that we're going to be looking at and discussing this morning is Moonlight Sonata at the Mayo Clinic by Nora Gallagher. So how many people are familiar with Nora and her work? A few of you, perhaps. Did any, does anyone have the book? I see Peggy has it. Did anyone else get the book and read it, perhaps? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys are missing out, for sure. So, um, so just a little bit about Nora herself. She is an Episcopalian, uh, and she has got, a, an, I would say, a half dozen books, perhaps, four, at least four, maybe five, but possibly six, um, that uh, are dealing with faith and her life and what she's experienced and, um, the, and the greater church. And so um, this particular book um, is really a personal memoir uh, uh, and a, her journey of um, faith and through an, her illness with her eye. Um, and that's why there's a picture of an eyeball on the cover. And so, um, and she really draws in the Episcopal faith. Um, she uses um, bits and pieces out of our prayer book um, as touchstones throughout her story um, and what she struggles with and, ha and how she's moving through all of this and coping with um, illness. You know, as the priest for pastoral care, I'm in hospitals and in illness all the time um, because I'm part of your lives and part of your family and part of your journey. Uh, but what was interesting about this book for me is that I was actually, there's something about our relationship. When you're in the hospital, you don't tell me everything, you know? You tell me bits and pieces, the pieces that you want me to hear. You know, you don't tell me some of the very personal stuff or some of the gross stuff or some of the stuff that you don't even, that you're denying at this point, that you can't even handle yourself. And so that makes sense. Um, and so hearing it from her perspective, her illness and her struggle with faith really questioned my ministry in a way and I'm like have I missed out on opportunities when I see you all in different aspects of your life um, and you know it's a give and take yes we could say I missed something but then there's also that other part of if you weren't ready to share or if you weren't ready to even understand what you're going through then there's no there's no there's this this in-between space and so, um, so it was very, it was, it's a very pastoral um, understanding of her illness and, and her faith. And so uh, there are three parts to the book. And then the first part, um, she titles it Drowning. And drowning in the sense of she is just completely overwhelmed with her diagnosis. And they're not really, in the very beginning, not even really sure what's going on. She has um, a black spot, um, and it first started off as a blur on the periphery of her eye. Um, and for any of you that have had eye issues, whether it's cataracts or something else, you know how traumatic not being able to see or not see clearly can be. And even if you haven't, if you just wear glasses and you, you lose a contact or your glasses break, you're crippled. I mean, you really, you're struggling without being able to see. And so as um, a writer, her vision is so much of what she take of, 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 of her work. She is able to see everything going on around her and being able to um, interpret that and translate that into her words um, and into her body of work. And so, um, so this beginning of the periphery of the blur begins to develop even more and more to um, dark spots um, around the edge of the eye that start to move into the center of her field of vision. Um, and uh, they found out, or they were figuring that it was something with her optic nerve, that it was a, an inflammation of the optic nerve and, and it was causing all of this pro these problems, but they could never really pinpoint. Um, she went through MRI and CAT scan and blood test and everything you could possibly imagine to try and figure this out and specialist after specialist after specialist. And so in the midst of all of this, she's just trying to comprehend and, and that drowning piece of just being completely overwhelmed and underwater and, 
not even knowing when to come up for air. Um, but one of the things that was that caught me at the very beginning of her her story was that she had gone and she splits her time between New York City and and uh, Los Angeles, or actually Santa Barbara. Um, and that she was in New York City and she had gone uh, to the library to look at maps. And I don't know about you, but I love to look at maps. And so this was a very interesting piece of her story. And uh, she had gone into an old map room and um, one of the oldest maps, uh, the Juan, Juan Vespucci's map of the world, Mapa Mundi, completed in 1526. And so it's, you know, this grand, really, piece of art, but also history. And, you know, she was looking at it and looking at what he saw as the world. And it was this big picture. It was, there, was not, there wasn't a lot of detail. There were, you know, shapes that were land masses and trying to figure stuff out, but it was the grand scheme of things. And then she introduced this word um, that, uh, and I'm going to probably say it incorrectly, but deroteros, I think that's how you say it, D-E-R-R-O-T-E-R-O-S. Um, and in English, that means courses or pathways. And that the smaller maps and charts, perhaps, that captains draw and pilots draw and use for navigating waterways, but the smaller maps, these uh, deroteros, have all of the nooks and crannies of the shoreline. They have all of the ins and outs, all of the detail that really um, bring light to what the surface, what the area looks like. Um, and that, um, she writes, what principally drove the makers of the large maps was conquest, and the smaller ones, discovery. My Derotero would be of the smaller coastline, the individual rock. I would draw it to tell others what to watch out for, what I learned, or what I knitted together, what sufficed. No essential truth, but a geography worth reading. And so that each of us has this coastline of ours, that it is jagged, and there are some smooth spaces, but we all know that there are, there's beautiful white sand in spots, and rocky shorelines and giant cliffs and lush green um, on all of our coastlines. And so that's what she is figuring out um, of, figuring of her discovery um, and what that looks like. And so I thought that was just a beautiful image of, of what her journey looks like and what all of our journeys look like. Um, and so she goes through this journey with, real, um, with a real sense of calling in, the, in a way that she is determined, just like any of us if we are ill, determined to figure out what's going on, but also holding on to her faith. She was a member of Trinity, or is a member of Trinity in Santa Barbara, and I don't know if any of you have been to that church or know what it's like. It's a beautiful little church. Um, right in Santa Barbara and over, you know, you op walk out the doors and there's the Pacific Ocean and it's just, it's just fantastic. And she was, um, she was fed by the church and she was fed by her faith and um, great friends with many of our church leaders and Barbara Brown Taylor and I mean she's, she's like one of those people like, ooh, I want to go to a dinner party with her because she knows all the right people and you're going to have a fabulous conversation and it's going to be it's going to be about faith, and it's going to be about history, and it's going to be about what's going on in the life of the world today. So, um, so she, she has all of this stuff, and, and she continues to talk about um, these different aspects of her life. And then she writes, human beings require a larger story to fit themselves into. I was fitting my life into the larger story, the larger map of Christianity. And so she is using the, that those small maps, the more detailed map of her life, and putting it in to that of the church and all of the people around her that were helping to support her and to give her what she needed. She also was someone who discerned a calling to the priesthood. And uh, she didn't have any formal training. She didn't go to seminary, but 
She is someone that we could easily have as a distinguished lecturer, um, and she could preach. Um, uh, she has, she's got those skills. And, um, but so she would, she'd preach, and she'd teach, and she'd give lectures throughout the entire country. And more and more, she felt this call to the priesthood and went through discernment and had the discernment committee at church and the discernment committee through the diocese and they're ready to, you know, check the box and say, yep, you are ready. This, we're going to do this. And she said no. And, um, and it was powerful um, what she said about it in that um, she says, I tried to find the right word, I told him, for the thing. Oh, wait. No, sorry. She goes, I was never quite sure entirely in the end why I stopped. The lingering question was, if I am saying no to that priesthood, to what am I saying yes? There was something on the periphery that I couldn't make out, and that connects her to her eye as well, um, that she couldn't make out that blur. Something she couldn't make out. A door closes and another one opens, said a friend, but it's hell in the hallways. <laughs> it's kind of true. So... Um, And so she, she didn't, you know, she was, she didn't know, she didn't know what she was supposed to, she knew after all the time, after all the discernment, after all of the talking, that it wasn't, it wasn't her call. But um, her husband, Vincent, um, also knew that it wasn't her call, um, and it wasn't his call. Um, and so to be, he didn't want to be the church spouse, he didn't want to be the priest's wife. Um, and so uh, it was a, a very important time for her, but in that, and sometimes the church can do some really horrendous things when it comes around discernment. And for her, seriously, <laughs> seriously, um, um, you know, she could have just been done with it all. She could have been, you know, you know what, this isn't for me and church isn't for me anymore, and I'm, I'm signing off of this book. Um, and that sometimes happens when people are, go through discernment and and it's usually when people aren't when they're denied they're like wait how does how can the church deny me of this this is what god is calling me to but then the church doesn't give a good path to move forward or past that but she didn't she stayed on um, and continued to grow in her faith and continued to do what she was called to do um, but through through this um, she's still having these issues with her eye and um, one of the things that I was getting ready to talk about or say was that um, through her work as being an, an, a writer and an author, because she also, her part-time job was working for Patagonia, um, so the outdoor equipment apparel company, and she would write text um, for campaigns and website and catalog and their stories and whatnot. So she, she had that job, and then she also wrote her books and preached and lectured and all that. But she talks about the power of words, and she writes, I tried to find the right word, I told him, for the thing it signified. The right word is like a piece of a jigsaw puzzle that perfectly slips into place. The right word leads to the next right word and makes things and ideas spring to life. The wrong word, how I would learn this when I fell into Oz, which I'll talk about in a second, deadens and destroys. In the beginning, John's gospel says, was the word. In the beginning, John's gospel said, was the word. And so that piece about the right word and the wrong word and what that can or cannot do um, is, is powerful. I've always believed that words have power. Um, and I'm very deliberate when it comes to using what words I use. Uh, you'll see, I'm, I'm, I process, I listen and I process, and it might take me a second uh, to figure out what word I want to use. And uh, all too often, as a society, we don't do that. We don't really think about what words we use. And as for her, she understands that, and she continues to remind us the power of words. Um, and she talked about 
this falling into Oz business. And that when she was diagnosed, she realized that there was this glass wall, and the glass was about a foot thick, 10 inches thick, I can't exactly remember what she said, but this thick glass wall was between her and everybody else. And that it's, her illness separated her, and she called it Oz, and that no one who is on the other side of it really understands what she's going through, unless you're in it with her. Doctors don't really understand it. They might if they've been through a significant illness themselves, but sometimes not really. Um, but other patients, they do. And then she said when she was well, she looked at people who were sick and just looked past them. Um, and you know, she looked at someone in a wheelchair or with an amputated leg or bald because of chemotherapy and she looked past them um, because she, one, didn't know how to handle it or deal with it or, or what to say. But once, and because they were in Oz, they were in that, that magical land of illness, but when she entered in, she finally saw them and looked at them and were a part of them, that they had this camaraderie. She talked about um, the first time she was ever in a wheelchair, and uh, this was later on in her treatment when she was at the Mayo Clinic, and she'd never been in a wheelchair before. And she rolled up to the curb to cross it. Her husband was gonna push her to the hotel across the street where they were staying, and there was a, another woman in, or maybe a younger woman, in a wheelchair. And she looked over and they just had this connection and made this nod of like, yeah, we're doing this, we're, we're in this together. Um, and so this, this understanding of Oz and what it was like really isolated her. And her isolation also then started to move into her faith. And, um, and it made me think even more today, because um, she talked about the Nicene Creed and um, about a friend who had lost her husband. And when it came time to be in church and, um, or, and what, after his passing and after you know, she's ready to get back and be present, um, she saw um, she saw Nora preaching that day and stood up and she preached and the sermon was great and fine and whatever and then she sat down and then what do we do? We stand up for the Nicene Creed um, and you start saying, you know, I believe in, we believe in God, the Father and uh, she continues and um, she didn't understand, she, she said, um, the friend said, then you stood up, she said, and started saying, I believe in God the Father, his only son, and I didn't believe it, so I stayed put. And she didn't come back to church. She was referring to the Nicene Creed, which begins, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. I believe that he came down from heaven. I had been standing up and saying the creed since I joined St. John's Cathedral. I can recite it like the poems I memorized in the fourth grade. But I took note that Sunday that one of my dearest friends found the words of the creed, the thing that divided her from the other people in the church and from me, when she had moments before and found a place to grieve. She found, felt safe, a place where she could cry after losing her husband. Then, then at that one moment, because she didn't believe it, she was separated. And so she goes on to say, shortly thereafter, I had a breakfast one morning at an Episcopal monastery in the hills above Santa Barbara and I asked a table full of priests what they thought about the creed. Three of them said they only mouthed parts of it. One of them, a young man from Los Angeles, said he was entirely frustrated with it because on Sunday he didn't have time to explain to the new people who might be there out of deep need or longing or because they had experienced something they didn't understand that the Virgin Mary and the Nicene Creed was a metaphor. She said she thought of her friend Jody. The church is better at telling people what the church believes than at eliciting from people what they believe. 
says Gary Hall, Dean of Washington Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Goes on to say, I think that anyone who gets themselves and their family up and goes to church in the face of so many attractive alternatives must have access to some deep truth or experience of God that they are seeking to make sense of in community. The church responds by boring them out of their minds and telling them what we think is shameful. And so that whole piece about the Nicene Creed, you know, it made me think. Um, and it made me think, well, how many times do we have people in our midst that don't understand it, that don't hold that as a truth for them, that they're seeking or they're trying to figure it out or they're going through this place where, you know, God doesn't feel almighty to me. You know, God has given whatever burden I'm carrying and, you know, this doesn't really feel all that great. Um, how, do, how do we get past that? And, um, and it made me think when I was in a rector search at one point, um, one of the first questions they asked me is, what do you think of the Nicene Creed? And I was just like, um, it's great. And <laughs> I mean, it was just such a weird question. I wasn't sure what they were asking. And I hadn't been in many rector searches, so I didn't know what the, I really didn't know what they were looking for. Um, and so I'm like, uh, say it every Sunday. Uh, it's the, you know, it was written in 325 at the Council of Nicaea. Like, I, I don't know what you're looking for. Um, but it, it makes you pause after, he, after hearing those words. Like, wow, there are people who can't say parts of it, people who are completely turned off by it. Um, but then there are some of us that are completely fulfilled and rejoiced in those words. But we all live in the same place. Um, and I think that's also part of our own personal maps and those ins and outs of our coastlines and where we come to our faith and, and we come to God. And so um, she goes on and she's trying to figure all this out. And she goes, um, I kept going to church, one foot inside, one foot outside, and on the talk circuit trying to find the words that would reach those inside but not sound too crazy to those outside it. I tried to explain that there were a bunch of us who went to church who were not filled with passion, with passionate certainty, nor were we stupid. We knew, for example, that the Gospels were written long after Jesus' death, that Paul's letters came first, before the Gospels, that scholars had figured out more or less, mostly less, at least some of the words of those of Jesus and those who were attributed to him hundreds of years after his death. And so she she's in this liminal place of going in and out of the church and trying to figure this all out um, and not really sure how it's all supposed to work. Um, and so, and in that, one of, um, her, her husband says after, so in this mix of going in and out and being in this liminal place and in the hallway, so to speak, um, her husband, Vincent, Vincent, calls her, and she was crying. And he said in a voice that was new to her, a voice that she hadn't heard before, that was meant to anchor her and um, give her some strength, he says, you'll have to live with ambiguity. You'll have to live with that for a while. Um, and um, that touched me, um, because we are a people of control, and we are people of knowledge um, and not knowing and not knowing what the future is going to look like or being able to plan puts us in that space of ambiguity um, and not knowing when it's going to end is even worse because you're just stuck and she talks also about thinking about things that have not happened yet um, and that I can sometimes be my own worst enemy because I think of all the worst case scenarios. Like if we, you know, like I like to try and eliminate risk, you know? Um, and I try to say, well, if we do it this way, then it's not gonna ha it's, you know, it eliminates these possibilities. You know, there aren't these consequences that could happen if we do it this way. Um, and so not, since she's always thinking about things that have not happened, yet. Um, she's trying to write her future um, 
but in the end, we all know that the future is going to be very different from the way in which we envision it or we write it. And so that's a hard thing for her to continue to jump through. Um, it's a hard thing for her to keep going with. Um, she talks, and, and what's funny is there's a lot about her journey in the church and what she experiences that I recognized here um, and in our life together. Uh, she talks about um, prayer shawls, and she wrote, A woman at church made me a prayer shawl. These shawls were hand-knitted from acrylic yarn so you could wash them, then blessed by those who were part of this ministry. I had seen them piled up on the welcome table at the coffee hour in strange bright colors and cringed. But <laughs> then Betty Bickle told me she had made me one. Betty had managed to be the stereotype of a church-going regular, elderly, quiet, dutiful. But I knew her to be in, in, but I knew her to be instead courageous, original, and kind. She also makes the best lemon bars. <laughs> when she told me she had made me a shawl, I practically ran down to church to pick it up. It was blue acrylic. I brought it home and lay down beside it. Junior, the cat, jumped up on the bed and headed for it. I held onto it with one hand the way children hold their blankie. We both fell asleep. When Vincent came home, he looked at, at it with some concern. <laughs> Betty Bickle made it, I said. Oh, he said, then it's fine. <laughs> After that, we called it one word, Betty Bickle's prayer shawl. <laughs> I think it works, I told Betty when I thanked her, and she looked at me as if to say, duh. <laughs> um, and so it's, it just it, it may, it makes me laugh, but it also makes me think about what we do um, with the prayer shawls, and, and Peggy's here, one of, those, one of our great knitters, but what we do when we have that prayer shawl up in the church and we offer a blessing for it and we all put our hands on it and that um, we are giving people um, some hope and some peace and prayers and we're wrapping our love around them. Um, and, um, and it made a difference for her and it, and it made a difference on her journey uh, to know that. And she was a prayer minister. She stood in the back of the church and offered prayers. And one of, her, um, one of her things was that she always thought that she didn't know how to pray or she couldn't find the right words to pray. But she realized when she was a prayer minister and she was standing in the back of the church that you know, there was no specific words that she came up with on her head. It was the Holy Spirit guiding her. And that you know, she would see somebody that she prayed for during coffee hour um, and uh, that, you know, they would, you know, nod their head to one another or lift a coffee cup just as, as, as a slight recognition that I see you and I'm with you um, and I will be with you. Um, and she writes, the prayer ministers and the priests know how many people were su know, knew how many people were suffering. The rest of us did not. I was embarrassed to be sick. I felt I had failed in some fundamental way. Um, and, and I'm stuck with that, that she failed, um, because she didn't. But there's nothing that we can do in our own heads to change that feeling um, when we're at our most broken peace, at our most brokenness. Um, you know, her priest knew she was sick. Um, her husband knew she was sick her closest friends, but no one else did. Um, and in the midst of understanding what everyone else was going through in their own prayer and being their most vulnerable, she didn't express that with everybody else. So she felt like she just couldn't, couldn't grasp that understanding of, um, not success, that's not the right word, but of being vulnerable and open to, um, to herself and to others, and to God. Um, after that moment, um, she got to another point where the Nicene Creed was said in her life. And um, when it was time, she stood up. Um, and when they began to speak the words, um, she could not. 
and she sat down. And she realized at that point she was not to be in worship any longer. Um, and uh, that's a tough thing. Um, I experienced that one time, and I was in my most broken place. And as much as I love the liturgy and worship and being in community, that wasn't going to sustain me. That wasn't going to fill me. Um, and so I couldn't be present um, because it wouldn't have been authentic. It wouldn't have been real. Um, and I wouldn't, be in give, I wouldn't be giving glory to God. Um, I'd be a big fat fake. That's what I'd be. Um, but that's one of those parts of our coastline, that jagged, rough part, or the cliff that we fall off, or whatever it might be. Um, we have those moments. And um, she realized, because her husband didn't go to church, he stayed home and read the New York Times and had his coffee and what so many of us love to do or aspire to do or dream to do or whatever it might be. Um, and so she started to do that with him. And at first it was fun because she got to have the style section first and, you know, <laughs> you know, just could be in the moment of that. But she realized after a couple of weeks that she was missing it. But she didn't know how to re-enter. She didn't know how to come back in and figure out where her place was um, because she was so wrapped up um, in church before and at this point felt so disconnected. Um, and so she started going to uh, kind of a, almost like a prayer group, but it was an, almost like an early church meeting. They met um, kind of in the basement of the church and they said prayers together and meditations together and they offered one another communion from the reserve sacrament, the, the blessed bread and wine. So there was no priest around. So it was really like one of those first century home communions um, that the early disciples were a part of. And she found strength in that. Um, and she struggled with meditation. She struggled with trying to find a, a quiet place in her head because everything, she kept this list. She kept, you know, if, especially if, if you are ill, your brain doesn't always work because of all the medications you're on. So you, you might have a book or you might always be taking lists on a legal pad, but of things that you need to remember, things that you need to ask, things you need to do. And so her list was constantly going in her head um, and she always struggled with that. Um, and uh, one of the guys in her, um, her group, I don't know if I have that one marked, um, talked about um, imagining God's presence being six inches from your face. And she was just like, oh, that's not good, you know. <laughs> like, I don't think I can do that. And then the next week he said, imagine this holy presence being even closer to you. And each, each week she worked and worked and worked to make that meditation, that, that piece of, of her spiritual life come back together. And she told her priest, like, you know, I'm not, you know, I feel bad about not being in worship. And he said, well, what are you doing downstairs? And she goes, well, he's like, it's not Sunday worship, but you are worshiping. Um, and that is to be um, rejoiced because that's where you're meeting God and where God is meeting you. And that's what all of this is about. Um, if we don't meet God in there, then maybe we need to rethink in there. Um, you know, I know for some of us, we meet God down at the gathering. That's a totally different space. Um, we meet God down at Jubilee. We meet God with the kids. Um, you know, for each of us, it's different. So um, if you're not meeting God someplace, maybe that's something to think about, something to work on. And so um, she continues, she, so after going really across the country and trying to figure out what is going on with her eye and her vision, um, she finally gets to the Mayo Clinic. 
and the title of Moonlight Sonata at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and so, and in case you're not familiar with Moonlight Sonata, Yeah. Oh, I can't. Oh, I know what I know the problem. Sorry. Let's see. Well, if the Wi Fi was on, it wouldn't have been a problem. Let's see. There we go. Sorry. And a Vino Baby commercial. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's a cute baby. I didn't know the, the title of that piece until I, I looked it up. So, but familiar. I think we've probably all heard it at some point in our life. And so if you have never read anything about the Mayo Clinic or seen pictures or know anyone that's been there, it's a pretty phenomenal place um, in Rochester, Minnesota. And they take great care in making sure that you don't feel like a patient. Um, that you walk in and the space is beautiful. And she talks about these giant Chihuly um, glass light fixtures that are in the opening uh, or the atrium in the walkway as you enter into the space. And that there's these floor, it's all floor to ceiling glass and there's so much light um, and there's no darkness. And that um, everybody is really rather pleasant um, and you're not standing in line waiting to fill out a form and that everything is coordinated for you so you really go from place to place and you know if you get there early they're gonna text the doctor and say hey Lisa's here and so come on down and I mean it really sounds amazing and so there is this piano in one of the open spaces and um, it said you know anyone is welcome to play it um, you know, be mindful of the community and, and play something that would be appropriate, essentially. Um, and so, and that was just kind of mixed in with all of the art. On every single floor, there was beautiful artwork or tapestries or rugs um, that just brought life and light into a space that can be very cold um, and unwelcoming. And so, she had had lots of tests and a, a, a lot of different appointments. And so uh, she writes, just after those final appointments, we were walking quickly through the great hall, skirting people, heading for the elevators, when my eye caught a man at the grand piano. Behind him was the wall of glass that framed the outdoor atrium. In the atrium, people were reading or sitting with their faces turned upward toward the rapidly diminishing sun. The man was wearing green scrubs as if he were either about to go into an operating room or had just left one. He had a small goatee. By sitting in scrubs at the piano, he had one foot in the medical world and the other somehow with us in Oz. He had just started playing the Moonlight Sonata. I stopped. He played beautifully. His concentration was complete. The music filled the space. I saw that Vincent had caught the pianist's eye and was nodding to him, a gratitude nod, and the man nodded solemnly back. Most of the people walking through the lobby just kept on going. We stood still. He had the narrow shoulders and skinny legs that mark little boys, and he was running with his arms open wide into the air. His head was bald. The longer I resided in Oz, the more I understood how fragile life is. But in that moment, with the sonata floating in the air, the man in his scrubs working to play it well, and the boy, a piece of straw in the wind, I felt it all together, completely. Vincent turned and we looked at each other and what was transmitted between us was the shock and fear and grief and gratitude 
that had collected so far that year that could not be, or as yet had not been, put into words. So um, just really a, a transcendent moment for her and for them. What they figured out after so many um, tests uh, is that she had a um, condition called, um, make sure I get to the right page so I can say it, and I'm probably not even going to say it correctly. Um, sarcoidosis, S-A-R-C-O-I-D-O-S-I-S, sarcoidosis. Um, and um, inflammation of uh, cells in uh, there's inflammatory cells, granulosas, granulomas found in the lymph node that clump together and leave deep grainy scars. Um, they sa she said, think of uh, it as a football huddle around the elusive claws. Um, and it can, it can affect almost any organ in the body. And it really, it, it's an, among autoimmune disorders. Um, and so your body is attacking itself. Um, and there can be no symptoms um, or um, and she said, one of the doctors said, you could cut sections of the body from top to bottom, and there could be um, these granulomas found in every single organ. So um, for her, it was um, in her eyes. Um, and uh, so once she found out what there was a name for her, her illness and what was going on, because they kept doing all different things, they thought it might be MS. Um, they thought it was other autoimmune stuff, um, but they figured this out. And uh, she said that there was a weight that had been lifted from her. Um, and I think we all feel that weight when we finally figure out what's going on, how it can be treated, what can be done with it, um, and how you're going to live your life with it. There is this weight of knowing I, I'm not in ambiguity any longer. I can, I can live my life, and I'm no longer in the hallway of hell. Um, I, that door has closed, we figured it out, this door is open, and I'm going to go through it. So um, she continues uh, in that um, she went back to church um, and continues to celebrate that faith. faith. Um, but, and she, she says that she lost that original faith, that, that faith that she was born with, that she discerned through that got her to the place, but she had found a new faith, um, a new faith based on this understanding of her, her life moving forward, um, and that there is a, a, a way, I don't know how to find it, um, and she talks about grace, and saying that if we think that if we constantly think of the negative or fill our lives with the things that we are thinking of that have not happened yet, then there's no place for God to enter and there's no place for grace to pull in our soul. Um, and uh, that's a powerful thing. If we don't allow for grace to pull on our soul, then where are we going to uh, get this part of our faith and part of God um, in us if we fill it up with all the things that have not happened yet. Um, and so she realized that um, she was able to find those pools of grace in her life and, and particularly in her soul, which was a word that she had not used in a very long time and had not used through this journey. Um, so, um, I think... Let's see. And just kind of one of her final remarks. She writes, This land of illness behind the wall is much larger than I thought, and through its lens, the world we all live in, what we call the natural world, becomes more precious. I said I would give quite a lot to have my old body back, but yesterday I saw the evening light falling on the old oak trees in our park. 
their bark like the skins of elephants. This world is so beautiful, and not only can I still see it, I no longer pass through it quite the same way I did before. I, at least sometimes, am in it, in its beauty, in its enchantment, in its divine life. I would not trade this information for more speaking engagements or for all the riches, or for most of them, in the world. Would I tra trade it for the old obliviousness? Maybe so, maybe not. And so um, she really goes through her whole journey. Um, and if, if her, her life is an island and that map that she's drawn and uh, circumnavig she's circumnavigated the whole thing, she's come full circle um, and is a stronger person for, for doing it. 